Hello, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. We're having folks file in. <clears throat> Felicia, you want to check the chat there? All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Grow Native Southwestern Illinois co uh, Event Committee's Native by Design virtual panel uh, called Nature at Your Doorstep. Uh, so we have a, a number of exciting local and regional experts on the call uh, to answer your questions about starting a native garden at your home. Uh, before we get into intros and start fielding questions, just want to give a thanks to uh, Felicia Ammon Brundick and the rest of the Grow Native team like Carol da David and Bill Rupert for uh, putting this on for us. Uh, and of course, our Southwest Illinois team, including Sarah Ruth, Christine Favila, Charlie Pitts, Scott Moss, uh, Steve Rendell, Elisa Royce, Brandon Banks, Landon Brooks, and Virginia wolf Filey for uh, putting everything together. So for folks who have been attending our spring workshop, stay tuned as we you know, try to predict the future in this new world along with everybody else. Uh, we hope we can offer something, but of course we have to act based on what the world gives us. So um, keep an eye out for announcements about that. Um, as we get started here, we're gonna go ahead and ask that you utilize the Q&A feature uh, to ask questions of our panelists here at the top of your screen and um, uh, click that button and type in your question. Uh, we know you're excited to talk native plants and share with other participants your experiences and your best practices. So for any other kind of back and forth like that or comments you wish to make um, or even just housekeeping questions for um, uh, the folks running the call, go ahead and utilize the less formal chat option for a lot of that, that kind of um, informal back and forth. Um, so we'll proceed with our discussion through several broad categories, um, and we'll, we'll show you what those are here at the front so that to the extent possible, try to stay on topic with the categories as we discuss them, and uh, that'll just help us keep everything a little bit organized. So with all that said, I would like to introduce uh, Felicia Brundick, Outreach and Education Coordinator with the Missouri Prairie Foundation and Grow Native, who has some announcements to share about upcoming Grow Native events. Felicia? All right. Thanks, Nate. Uh, thank you all for attending. We're really excited about this great panel with all of these, um, these very knowledgeable people. Uh, I just wanted to real quick uh, share with you that um, that slide with our sponsors on it. Um, if you have uh, any questions about you know, any of these sponsors, please uh, uh, go to grownative.org and um, you, can, you can learn more. Um, we have a great resource guide if you're looking for native plants or services uh, at, at grownative.org as well. Um, and we have a lineup of different webinars and um, master classes, all sorts of different events that are coming up through the end of December. And we're about to start planning for our um, late winter, early spring uh, webinars as well. So uh, stay tuned for more details and check the website. Um, thanks a lot. And Scott, you can go ahead. On mute. Thank you very much for that introduction. We are going to kind of proceed with the agenda. So uh, for tonight, we've got an hour to, to sort of get all of this information in. Uh, we're going to take as many questions as we can, and we're going to try to limit the uh, discussion points to about eight minutes per topic. Again, some of them will probably get a little more discussion than others. 
Um, but we're going to try to keep this thing on a, on a timely flow basis. Want to make sure everybody gets a chance to sort of get their questions answered. And so uh, in developing this, um, the panel has come up with uh, usually the same, the, the majority of the questions that we hear, which is site selection, you know, how do I choose the right site for native planting? Um, what do I do with it once I've chosen it with site selection? The selection of plants is always a big topic and we'll spend quite a bit of time there. Um, there, there are challenges and with natives, there are myths and things that we need to understand. Um, and then there's, a, there's the difference in maintenance that takes place with these native plantings and sustainable landscapes. And so these are the topics, uh, we'll present them sort of in order and each one of our panelists has uh, some particular expertise about that that we'll, we'll be sure to try to introduce and get everybody a good, uh, a good time slot. So with that said, we want to do some introductions here very quickly. Uh, leading us off, Debbie Rathler. Debbie Rathler is a, an accomplished uh, master naturalist and master gardener. She's recognized and award winning. Uh, Charlie Pitts, who is uh, also a master naturalist. Uh, I've known Charlie for years. He uh, you know, was introduced with some of the original things I was doing with native plants. And uh, he has a tremendous amount of experience uh, over the years with uh, native plants and working with them. We got Crystal Steven, oh, sorry, Christa, Christine Favela, who is with Sierra Club. She's the Three Rivers Project Coordinator. Uh, Christine is one of, uh, has a student in, has been a student in my program. Um, and so I hope I haven't ruined her too much, but uh, she's got a tremendous amount of experience with a lot of very diverse community projects. So she's like uh, many on this panel, she's learned some hard lessons. Uh, Crystal Stevens, who is an author and an artist and a, uh, a teacher, she, she's just doing a lot of really extraordinary things. She's really sort of defining, I think, what horticulture is gonna be in a sustainable world. We've got Hannah Hemelgar, who is uh, with the University of Missouri uh, Center for Agroforestry, and who again is a very uh, accomplished expert in, in agroforestry, um, permaculture, and has a lot to offer, especially on the edible side. And then uh, myself, who uh, I am the coordinator of restoration ecology, at Lewis and Clark Community College. And again, I, I enjoy the uh, fine distinguishing thing of trying to put the next generation of, of workers into the field of restoration ecology and sustainable landscaping. So that's our panel for the, for the day. And uh, certainly I'll try to direct, as the moderator, I'm gonna try to direct traffic to the people who can best answer your questions. And so let's start off with a, a reality check. When I talk to my students, when I introduce this topic, when I speak at, uh, at garden clubs, um, again, I always lead off with the idea that, that you know, we're not doing restoration here. This is, this is uh, landscaping. And so it takes a lot of, of diverse directions. It really, landscaping is, is what you want it to be. So uh, we have experts on our panel who are very focused on uh, food production. And there are a lot of native choices with food uh, herblore, uh, pollinator specialties. And so there are a lot of things here. The reality is that 100% you know, native is not gonna necessarily be realistic in most suburban settings. Certainly you can achieve high levels of native plants in your systems, but uh, in no way, shape or form, uh, generally, or even I, and I'm probably as, as uh, far into this as anybody goes, are we advocating that we eliminate non-native plants from our landscape? Um, the question then becomes how do we blend uh, nature and our cultivated landscapes to get a better landscape, to create a functional landscape that actually uh, doesn't do more harm than good. And so we specifically want to focus on areas of functionality. Uh, again, it's really not doing much for us if it's not functioning in at least some sort of natural way. Uh, certainly aesthetics are always going to come into play when we talk about a, a landscape, whether it's native or, or food production or cultivated. Uh, the creation of habitat, so pollinator and uh, pollinator interactions is always one that comes up. And then of course, the overall goal, which is to sort of enhance, use our, our landscapes around us uh, to enhance ecological services and the interactions with nature. And so, you know, I always say when, uh, when we lead off, we start talking about native landscapes, this is what we all think we're gonna do. Uh, it's a fantastic example of blending a lot of native and non-native plants into a, a really nice landscape. Um, unfortunately, the, the fear of most people is that we end up um, with this. And again, it's not uncommon for, um, for us to make plant selections that, that do. These are generally, these are wild uh, organisms. They, uh, we're, we're, they don't have thousands of years of cultivating uh, selection behind them. And so they do sometimes, you know, get a little bit out of control. 
And so I think our panel of experts is going to be able to help guide you in how to, to achieve the first goal uh, while not falling into the trap of the second picture here. And so we'll start off with our discussion topic of site selection. Um, you know, getting the, the selection criteria for natives and uh, the subtopics that we came up with with site characteristics and conditions and the characteristics of the plants, uh, cultivar choices and the specific focus on uh, how to attract the best site for pollinator systems and, you know, the goals and outcomes that we'll be looking for. And so I'm going to kind of throw this over to the rest of the panel uh, for site selection. I know that uh, Christine Favilla and Hannah uh, Hemelgarn both have some ex extensive experience on this. So I'll, uh, I'll let Christine lead us off. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, I believe. We need to have him stop. There we are. Okay. Is everybody able to see this? Okay. Great. So basically site selection is going to be, you know, as varied and as different as you have a site out there in the world to do it. Um, I've done things in uh, parks that are considered very passive with um, you know, no infrastructure at all. I've done them in places that have a skate park just 10 feet away from it. So I always think of, um, you know, just really studying your land first. Um, definitely doing a sun map. Uh, I would also do a water map at the exact same time. So just going out at at least six times throughout the day at, at intervals. Um, and just mapping where the sun is. So just make a whole map of your entire house or your site, try and figure that out first. Um, then you're gonna want, if it's, if it's on a hill or a flat space, or it, it really depends on what you're wanting to achieve with uh, your native plantings. If you're wanting a rain garden, then of, of course, hopefully your site is something that's been inundated with water for quite some time. Um, this is just a very small example of one that we have at Hellrun Park. I went out, I had an intern, we were able to, um, basically do, oops, basically look at, um, this is just one fourth of it, where the sun was. I had her study how high the plants were. We also did kind of a color comparison. And then we planned it out in that way, knowing that if um, the one that my cursor's on right now grows too tall, then the ones right here in the middle are gonna be completely shaded. So let's plan for that ahead of time. Also thinking about what's the future of that land. Are you eventually going to wanna put in an oak tree, for instance. Um, this one is my front yard, so it's very different. It's in be it's a 10 foot strip between my neighbor's driveway and my driveway. And so also having to look at the, the sun, the height and the drainage, I wanted to make sure that I had um, spaced out enough. So those hula hoops are kind of my, <laughs> it's my go-to every time I'm, I'm putting together a plan. I have, you know, one, two, three, four foot wide Hoop. So the site selection really is just as varied as it as it can be, but you want to make sure that you're really thinking those few things through that I had mentioned. And I can stop sharing my screen. Um, I think there's one more on site selection. This is my backyard mess, and we can talk about it later with another one, but um, this site just needed a whole lot of help here where it was low lying and wet and draining into my basement. So this one was really trying to tackle the problem and not necessarily become a pollinator project with children. Okay, Christine, while we still got you on there, do you want to, there's a question from Sherry Ann Cordova about sun maps and, and sort of um, specifically to a north side, uh, uh, you know, quite sunny in the summer, but a lot of shade in the winter. You know, we do see this quite a bit, especially with, with any type of gardening, so. Yeah, I mean, just being practical about what's going to survive over there and how much time and energy you're going to put be able to put into it if it is on a shady side there are a lot of wonderful natives um i have a small corner that has a uh, deep shade and then it kind of fans out into um, kind of the spotted area and then into full sun i do find that some plants that say they're full shade actually do okay in part shade and i think we'll probably talk about that with plant selection but um i would do a sun map and a water map for all seasons, see what's happening in the spring versus the hot summer and then later in the fall because those trees 
and what their leaves and those conditions are gonna have a huge impact on your summer growing season. I would also add to that, and I guess, um, Scott, if it's all right, I'll just jump in on this topic. Um, sound good? Uh, is I think another piece to consider in that is the the plant life cycle and, you know, how that timing of the light um, is coincides with different, you know, flowering, you know, different periods in that plant's life uh, throughout the year. So something to consider. You may, you know, if it's just shady in the winter, maybe it's not an issue. And I am also going to share my screen. Uh, let's see, got to choose the right thing here when there are a lot of things open. <laughs> hmm. I'm not seeing my PowerPoint on here. If I could chime in real quick while you're looking, one yeah. thing I'm I wanted to point out on the long skinny area is having a variety of plants. So herbaceous, woody, low lying, so that you have a real nice depth and height to all of it. And that once again, throughout the seasons, you get that variety at all times. Yeah, definitely. So um, <clears throat> coming from the sort of permaculture design philosophy, sort of a holistic design philosophy and I think all of this really coincides well with what Christine was describing. So I'll go through this pretty quickly and then I just wanna share a few resources that could be helpful for you depending where you are. Um, so this is just an example that also shows, you know, you can lay out, if you have um, an overhead map, you can take a screenshot from Google Maps um, and start with that. Um, you can also use USGS and NRCS mapping programs and I'll show a few of those here in a second. But um, you can see here uh, the winter sun and summer sun identified. So I find that this is easiest to do if I just print off a map and start doing some sketching by hand. I'm not quite as tech savvy with, uh, with Illustrator and things, but you can get fancy with it. Um, so as Christine was talking about thinking about where the water is, um, you know, what, what are your dry spots? How is the sun and the shade affecting the space? Slope and aspect. Um, Doing some soil testing is always really helpful. And also um, indicator plants are, are pretty useful. If, if there's all, already a lot growing there, you can tell if you have plants growing there that thrive in nutrient rich spaces um, or that are have waterlogged and don't drain well, you know, you can tell a lot based on what, what's already thriving. Um, and then, so I mentioned NRCS. They have a really wonderful tool called the Web Soil Survey. And um, you can just go in there and, and draw a box around your site and it'll give you all of this information about what soils are there. USGS Topo Maps is really wonderful if you wanna get a sense of um, even subtle elevation change and aspect. And I also wanna just mention the USDA Plants Database. This might come in um, and be more relevant for our, our plant selection topic, but just another really great resource out there. And windrows, you know, if you um, have a concern about plants that might blow over easily, um, this is a really cool resource that Meteo Blue is one of many different um, meteorology resources out there that you can just type in your location and it'll give you a windrow. So this is just telling you um, how strong the winds are coming at different directions at different times of the year. And I think that's all for me for this topic. So I'll stop sharing. Okay, so that's a little over eight minutes on that topic. Um, I don't wanna rush us through this thing by any means. I know we had some good uh, things going on in the chat room. I'll throw it out for any other remaining panelists, anything to add to that before we move on to the next topic. While you're doing that, I'm gonna share my screen again. We did have one more question. I don't know if that was answered. Additional resources. I know, Hannah, you touched on that. Okay, yeah, and certainly um, anything that doesn't get addressed in, immediately in the, in the chat or the discussion, um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end if we need it, uh, as well as just being able to follow up tomorrow with, uh, with email information if anybody requests it. So we'll move on. Uh, once we've selected our site, 
Uh, we certainly want to start asking the question, you know, what is the next step and how are we going to deal with that, um, preparing that site for maximum success. Uh, again, there's a lot of variation to how people approach this. Um, you know, the removal of competing vegetation, do I disturb the soil, do I not disturb the soil? Um, if I do disturb the soil, do I start amending it and changing it, modifying it? Um, do I use cultural controls for weeds or do I use chemical uh, controls? And again, I know this, the, my familiarity with the panelist members know we, we have a lot of, of uh, very widely um, you know, dispersed opinions and, and knowledge about this. So again, I, I kind of, since um, Christine and, and Hannah both have sort of already been in here on the site prep, I've got uh, those two plus Debbie uh, rather sort of queued up to, to address this topic. So, uh, Debbie, you want to go ahead and lead us off? I need to unmute and then I'm going to um, share my screen. Let's see. Are you seeing my screen here now? Yes, we see it. Okay. Okay, um, well, I have tried three different ways of prepping the soil. One was at a site at the watershed in Edwardsville where we put cardboard down in the fall and then we put shredded leaves over the top of it and let it set all, all winter long and plant it in that matrix the next spring. That worked very well. And that's kind of a common way of uh, if you're working with a smaller area. Um, but my slide here, this back part where the goldenrod is that you can see, um, that was prepped because we had grass growing in there. And that was prepped by, and I know a lot of people don't wanna use chemicals and I don't either, but sometimes if you've got thick grass, you, it, um, I wanted to try it out. So we, we put Roundup on that small area and let it die, let the grass die. And then I just planted these plants right in the dead grass like a week later because it was in the fall and it worked quite well. And then I put bark chips over the top just for the, a tree that we had that fell and had chopped up. So that worked quite well. Now this fall, and this is the front part of where the hoe is laying on this slide is um, a new, way I'm doing it. And this, I just am hoeing out and sitting on the ground and digging out the grass by hand so as not to have to use Roundup. And it's working really well. The grass came up pretty well. It remains to be seen how much I left in the grass or in the ground next spring, we'll see. And already um, I'm seeing little seedlings of probably weeds, uh, annual weeds that are coming up in the, in the dirt. So I have some pretty, uh, I have some natives that I'm going to plant in there that I've already planted in, and I'm going to put um, bark chips. You can see them in the wheelbarrow there on the side. And this is kind of good for um, for just try suppressing the weeds. I did not amend any of the, you know, I didn't soil amend or anything. You don't really need to do that with natives. You, you don't uh, really worry about water all that much. Maybe at the beginning um, when you're first planting them. Um, and then this is my one bed after I did that. Um, and you can see the things grew, the natives grew in there quite well. And I don't have a lot of weeds coming up in there. So hopefully some of those things will self seed and I'll get a little more fuller, um, uh, fuller fauna in there next year. But the hand removal of the grass, I think I kind of like that. It's kind of uh, brainless, thinking work that you sit there and pull out the grass <laughs> while you think. And so I kind of like that way. Um, but like I said, the cardboard works well too. So that's kind of my two slides that I wanted to show you on that. I have a couple of slides that show um, something just a, a little bit different with mine, if that's okay. So, um, this you can see I did the exact same thing I, I just used a shovel and I dug out every clump of grass. I uh, turned it over knocked all the dirt back in the ground and then I would actually put it upside down, you know, just the green down and then put those um, lids on top of it until it was dead. 
it seemed to work okay. My neighbors thought I was absolutely crazy. And then the next year I decided I wanted to do a much larger space. And you can see in the third uh, area over to the right, I rented a sod cutter. And I had several areas um, that I did with the side cutter and it was probably the best $56 I'd spent all year in getting my beds prepped. Um, I only planned on doing that once. I did a lot of leveling after that. And um, the site that you see, if, 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 I think you can see my cursor. And the first one right there, the first picture going that is the same as this, which is the same as this. And then this is the growth of all the natives um, that second year, uh, looking from one side and then turning and looking from the opposite side. So not a lot of weeds in there at all. Um, I just really heavily mulched it. What did you mulch it with? Um, I actually, since I'm also with the Milton uh, School Gardens, we usually work with Wood River Township um, and they get Fosterberg tree uh, mulch and then they like double and triple shred it. It's fantastic. And it's free. The price is right. <laughs> I, this is uh, Charlie. I'd like to add a couple of things. Uh, notice that in this conversation, there was not a great deal of soil amendment. It was not added mulch or anything. They just simply removed the existing uh, vegetation and planted new vegetation and let it go. And that's one of the benefits of native plants. This is where they've grown up. This is where they live. This is home. They don't need a lot of extra stuff. So it's even easier if you're planting native plants in an already main garden. All you have to do is dig a hole and pop them in. It's, it's really uh, much, much simpler. If you're gonna remove or create a new garden area, then the techniques that they've shown you are very viable and really work down the line. But if you're just adding to an existing garden, all you need is a shovel. And I'll just add one, one other technique. Um, I think the cardboard and mulch is <laughs> just about all you need. Um, but if you have a larger area, I know even some organic farmers um, have done this for prairie strips, laying out a long strip of um, actually clear plastic um, so that the, the weeds are solarized, they actually go to seed and then they're, um, they're desiccated and, um, and they don't come back. So um, it's just another option of just smothering, smothering the grass if, or whatever other other vegetation you have that you're wanting to replace. And in the chat, this is Virginia, um, Mitch asked Christine if she had to add soil back after using the sod cutter. Sorry, I was just trying to answer that typing it out. I, um, once again, since I work with some different community gardens, we order a large amount and then everybody kind of pays their fair share. And we get a mix from St. Louis compost that is half compost and half garden soil. It's not guaranteed to be organic. Um, and I, but I've always found it to be a really good product. Um, if I don't do that, I go and get, there's a place in downtown Alton that has some really good uh, black forest soil and I mix it with peat moss and sand, depending on what I'm, planting. So yes, yeah, some of the soil and some extra soil gets added back in if there's too much grass. But as far as amending it with like compost or something like that, what, according to what Charlie was saying, it's not really necessary it, unless you want more soil there, I guess is what you're saying, right? Yes, but also sometimes, you know, a lot of the, the native soils have been removed over the years and the neighborhood's clay, it might be what was backfilled or it might just really be a clay area that has had a lot of that, um, that duff and upper topper layers removed. So I find clay doesn't work for a lot of plants if, if it needs better drainage. So that I added that as well and sand usually then. Okay, I think we have one remaining question in the Q&A session uh, from Angie McDowell, uh, Angela McDowell, and that's, um, again, the question about a couple of some plants that you bought a couple of years ago, 
the transplanting of native plants is really honestly going to be similar to transplanting any garden plant with the exception they generally have much larger root systems um, and so again you have to be recognized that you're dealing with a much larger uh, system of roots uh, but again I don't know that my experience and again I'll, we have a short time on this topic but the rest of the panelists can certainly weigh in uh, I move these things all around uh, all the time they they transplant they're generally pretty tough as long as they wind up in the right conditions, they generally do pretty well. So does anybody have anything to add to that? Scott, I think we need to move on to our next topic. We're right at 10 minutes. Okay, I'm ready to move. So we'll go ahead and move on to what I anticipate will probably be one of the bigger uh, discussions of the day. Uh, certainly the selection of plant and plant associations. And this gets into a number of questions. Um, I frequently get asked, you know, where can I get these things? And, and you know, in the 15 to 20 years that, uh, that I've been doing landscape with native plants, I can tell you that the, the ability to access native plants has considerably changed. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you, to be able to buy these things was a highly specialized thing. And uh, now there are probably several different uh, cultivars or, or species of native plants available at the, the big retail outlets. So certainly they are more available than ever. We can definitely guide you. I've got a few things here on the desk uh, it, to help. Uh, cultural guides and guidance. You know, once you do start looking for these plants, sort of uh, how do you make these selections? And, and so we can talk through how to do cultural guides and how to read those and make the best decisions. And then um, color and spacing and layering. Again, it, it, landscaping with native plants is gonna be like landscaping with any other type of plant. You're gonna make the choices based off of color and texture and, and sort of the interactions. And so I think um, it really sort of becomes an, a fun uh, and interesting challenge to, uh, to sort of integrate these things into your landscape. So uh, with that said, I, again, I got every, just about everybody on the panel has is, uh, is said that they wanna be involved in this. Um, I'm going to kind of select Charlie. We haven't heard from him in a while and, uh, and let him lead this thing off and then everybody else can sort of jump in as necessary. So I guess it's my turn. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the thing is, is that plant availability is, is really uh, been absolutely wonderful. Uh, recently, and all those uh, guys that were listed on sponsors of this particular uh, uh, webinar are folks that are committed to producing and providing native plants to both the local community. And by the way, those are mostly local natives, which means that they're indigenous to this particular region rather than from upper Michigan. Uh, and, uh, Missouri wildflowers is one of the well, better known selections, although there are a lot of other uh, uh, grow native folks that uh, grow native uh, nurseries that provide stuff. And there are lots of small guys that are just growing uh, plants for the heck of it that you can find at some of the local uh, farmers markets, although they're kind of closed up for the year. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, plant availability is that you can, a lot of these vendors are willing to try to track down particular plants if you want, if you have a particular plant that you're looking for. Uh, that's a really great thing. That's as opposed to some of the uh, stores that, uh, I don't mean this pejoratively, but the big box stores which generally don't know where their plants come from or really what they are. So our advice is to deal with a reputable nursery that can tell you, if they can't tell you the scientific name of the plant, they're probably not the right person to buy a, a native plant from. Uh, that's a terribly important. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say on that. Cultural guides uh, from their cultural guides are available on several uh, websites that you can download and it tells you when you said, what's a cultural guide? Okay, this plant likes sun, it likes, uh, <clears throat> it likes wet feet, it likes uh, it flowers in June, it 
it attracts butterflies. Though well, that's a cultural guide. So you could, if you're finding a particular plant, you're looking for a plant that you want to be about three to four feet tall and you really kind of like a yellow flower, that's what you go to a cultural guide for. And they're really wonderful for that. Uh, Scott's probably going to want to add something to that because uh, I know that he works with that uh, kind of thing a lot. Yeah, I'm sitting here. I've got uh, Missouri Wildflower Nursery and I've got the uh, Grow Native Resource Cultural Guide. I got all these things kind of sitting there in the shelf behind me. Um, again, different, different providers will do this differently. Some of them organize the plants uh, in sections by sort of criteria that you're looking for and then show you pictures. Um, some providers have a, a matrix that they'll list the plants either, you know, alphabetically by scientific name or common name, and they'll have a matrix that you can choose from. Um, some of them are incredibly detailed. Uh, again, I usually, you know, when I'm teaching in this particular class, tell my students to go out and download every free, you know, online cultural guide they can get. Uh, and you can spend an entire week, seems like, uh, just pouring through the details of these native plants. So, you know, the first step I always tell people is, is um, you're learning, you're trying to learn about native plants, dive into the cultural guides, think about the things that you want, learn the, the plants that you're, you know, interested in. And then, uh, you know, kind of, I always say backtrack to the site that you're trying to plant them into in the conditions. Um, but again, it's, it's a sort of always a research and give and take. The plant finder on the MoBot site is excellent and it's, it's um, mm -hmm. local you know, you know it's going to grow well. They have um, plants of merit. Is that what they're called? That uh, being, is that what they're called? And they are plants that grow well in this area. They have relatively um, few problems, but they're called plants of merit. So you can look for those that are easier to um, grow on the MOBOT site. Yeah, the USDA plants database, I think was referenced earlier and it's fantastic as well. So, um, you know, plant selection is one of those things can eat up a lot of time if we, if we allow it to, um, you know, any, anybody else specifically with the experience with, with color and spacing and layering. I know Christine, I know a lot of the stuff you and I have kind of discussed with your plantings and you've done a lot of multi layering stuff where you've got shrubs and, and vegetative plants mixed. Do you want to, offer anybody any advice on that? Sure. Um, well, I I will actually share my screen real quick again, if that is okay. And I think that's it. You know, it's not a plan unless it's written down. I am a huge planner and sometimes it starts, you know, just by going out, like I said, in the rain and staring at a spot in my yard and trying to figure out what's going on. But then I get out all of those books and those guides and notes that I've taken from different conferences about kind of what I have in mind. And then I just sketch it out. Um, the sketch definitely changes because, um, you know, part of those I know I'm getting from Crystal. Part of those I know I'm getting from Three Rivers Farm and then the rest I'm going over to a Grow Native um, event. So you have to kind of work with what they're going to have. So you know, Scott still has people at Lewis and Clark that get my texts like, hey, do you have a New Jersey tea plant? No, um, but it's always worth just kind of checking. There's several um, Green Thumb Nursery Tom Shirell owns and Godfrey, and he is very easy to work with. He will, I mean, they'll just grow things for you for the spring and let you know when it'll be available. And I believe that's how a lot of these growers are. So you know, do your best to plan with all of those things we talked about earlier, but um, I, I write it down every time. And then you know what it is later if, if you need to move it and such. All right, thank you. I, I wanted to throw, a, I haven't had a chance really to hear from Crystal much, and this is an area where she's got some really specific expertise in plant selection. Um, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, wild edibles and edible plants in general and, and uh, even herbal uh, remedies. So be certainly interested in the few minutes we have left to hear uh, that unique side of this for sure. Sure. I think, I think my screen is glitching. <laughs> can you hear? We can definitely hear you. Um, we're not necessarily seeing anything if you have trying to Is it lagging in the time? 
Yeah, seems like it just a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. time lag. For some reason, my computer is being really uh, crazy right now. Uh, okay. I do have a slide show queued up to, to share some of that, but I'm not sure if it's actually gonna do it. My computer, unfortunately, is. Um, let me see if I can share the screen. If, feel free to answer a question while, while I try to do this. I apologize. Well, I might jump in here to also share a little bit about edibles and hopefully this will complement what Crystal is about to share. Um, Cause in agroforestry, we're really focused on perennial native edible and medicinal plants um, in, in the landscape in all sorts of ways. But uh, we've done quite a bit of work with service berry or June berry, that's a and, um, and pecans and walnuts and aronia, um, hazelnuts, there are lots and lots of options and that's that's just the woodies. So um, Crystal, I don't want to <laughs> dominate here, but, and I've got a bunch of slides on on a, a lot of those plants if folks are interested. Pawpaws are one that are growing in popularity lately. Yes, I have a, a presentation, but it will not load for some reason, I apologize. I have actually what exactly what you're mentioning, Hannah, um, a slide demonstrating sort of a, a food guild or a planting guild where you can uh, integrate nitrogen fixing plants, natives, uh, perennials, fruit bearing, nut bearing, tree crops as a low shrub layer, um, all kind of intermingling together in, the, in a beautiful uh, landscape, which can be a mini food forest in your front yard. Um, can you all hear me or is my computer glitching? I apologize. Crystal, I just yeah, pulled up some slides in case this is helpful. I don't know if you can see them, but um, some of these same concepts. So the layers of a forest garden um, and then, you know, lots of information about all of these species, hazelnut, pecan, aronia, elderberry, of course, black currant, pawpaw. Berry, herbaceous edible perennials, and even at-risk herbs that um, many of these are shade obligate and need our help to, to restore their habitat and bring them back into abundance. Absolutely. Um, a specific one that we could all grow uh, as a medicinal that is multi-purpose, it, it, on the risk list by the United Plant Savers is Echinacea angustifolia. And so Perpia is a main native that everyone grows for its uh, medicinal content, but angustifolia is the one that's harvested for its roots. It has thick fleshy roots and that's where the, the root medicine comes from. So grow both in your gardens. Okay, so we're, we're sort of already, which I knew was going to happen, we're kind of beyond the eight to 10 minute mark on this one, but that's okay. I mean, this is probably the key topic of the entire thing. Um, did have a question from uh, uh, Pamela Haas, or Haas about uh, growing butterfly milkweed uh, from seed. It's actually remarkably easy. Um, it does require a cold stratification. Uh, the tuberosa butterfly milkweed will You'll get small amounts of germination on that one um, if you just sow it in wet soil. Some of that will grow, the majority of it won't. Um, if you want to cold stratify it, I think it's 30 days. Um, if you store it damp, wet soil in a refrigerator for 30 days and then sow it and plant it, it will generally grow. But it has, if you buy it from uh, you know, commercial sources, you're going to get better germination rates uh, collected or, or wild native seed is generally going to have lower uh, germination rates, but we usually, we grow a lot of this stuff. It's usually pretty easy. So um, certainly if you want more information on that, um, again, just to kind of remind us at the end, we'll shoot you an email with more details. So let me go back to sharing my screen so we can kind of move this thing along.
And so I'm assuming that, uh, that that actually worked. And it's always weird how it jumps over to this other scene uh, screen. So, um, so let's deal with challenges. Um, Native landscapes, there's a myth that, you know, just plant them and you walk away from them. That is absolutely not the case. A landscape with native plants is unlike, not unlike any other landscape. It still requires effort. You're still going to have to, to deal with the inevitable things that are going to happen. Um, one of the things that I can tell you from planting native plants all over my yard, I'm, the, you know, the only, really the only plants within about a half a mile in my neighborhood. People in my neighborhood don't like plants, it seems like, except for turf grass. Uh, the animals come to my yard to eat. Um, it's just a fact. I kind of got used to it a long time ago. I just plant triple of everything so that they, you know, I can feed the animals because that's why I'm doing it. Um, there are always pest concerns. So we, we, you know, we've got experts who can address that. Um, the appeasing the neighbors, uh, I'm probably not the right guy to answer that question. Um, again, I just referenced how I'm the only guy growing plants in my neighborhood. And generally, if uh, somebody asks a question about it, they, well, they, I don't, I'm just that guy. I'll just admit it. Um, and then the issues with spray drift, because the neighbors are doing uh, what they do, which is maintain a traditional lawn landscape. And so oftentimes this does become an issue. Uh, it happens probably as frequently out in agricultural areas as well. So on the challenges, um, kind of had the order set up with uh, with Debbie and, and, uh, and Crystal and then myself to kind of jump in here, but certainly everybody's welcome. So, um, you know, Debbie, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, challenges that you faced and you know, certainly don't be afraid in the uh, in the audience to, to throw specific questions into the uh, question and answer. Okay, yes. Um, some of the challenges that we have, because we kind of live, well, we live by SIUE. And if anybody has ever driven through SIUE, you know that that's where all the deer in Madison County live. And uh, so we have problems with deer, although I have to say that I don't have that much of a problem at my house with the deer, I don't know why. But we, um, I wanted to address kind of what some people might think of as pests, but when you kind of start thinking of the food chain, food chain, then you maybe not, won't think of them as pests. And so here's a picture, you see this picture of of these caterpillars on this um, milkweed. Well, there's a couple of things going on here. It's a common milkweed and it's covered in aphids on the green part, but then I had all of these other caterpillars growing on there and this is common milkweed and obviously they're not monarch caterpillar. Well, they're, t they're, they're milkweed tussock moth uh, caterpillars. And so they totally, decimated, they totally decimated a couple of my um, milkweed plants. And that's okay because I have uh, several different varieties of milkweed. And so that's one suggestion I would make would be to plant different varieties, especially if you have these tussock, uh, tussock moths. Um, you have to kind of be careful not to touch them because the, those little spines get right in your fingers and then they kind of hurt. But um, some people would look at that and say they're pests, but they're native. These caterpillars are native. So really, you know, they have as much right to eat on my milkweed as the monarchs do. So you kind of have to have a change, a mind change about what your plants are going to look like. Um, yeah, the leaves of my common milkweed were not that pretty, but the birds, they're, you know, uh, ferocious feeders on these caterpillars. And so um, it's just kind of what your priorities are. So you, you kind of have to get over having everything being neat and tidy. And so I kind of want to mm -hmm. go on to the next thing about appeasing the neighbors while I have the slide share here thing is because I don't have to appease my neighbors because my neighbors are all my relatives. I have family living on both sides of me. But my husband, whom I live with, he is kind of a different type of gardener. He likes things to be neat and tidy. And this is his garden. He plants coleus, and salvia, and begonias, oh, Debbie. and melissum. Debbie, yeah. uh, we're yes. not seeing your screen. Could you hit sh screen share again? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, screen share. Can you see it now? Nope, Share not yet. Screen. No bummer. 
Okay. Uh, let me hold on. Hold on. Somebody else want to. While while she's pulling that up, um, there was a question out in the in the chat room about rust fungus. Um, again, I I'm not really familiar with that. Again, it, rust fungus I think is more of a horticultural challenge. So does anybody have any advice on uh, battling rust fungus? Um, well, there's a cedar apple rust fungus and where you need to have a cedar tree and then you can have it on your apple trees, but that's about as much as <laughs> I think we can get into it on that. Are you seeing my screen now? Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, these are the tuss-up moths that I was talking about, first of all. Uh, they're spiny and they're hairy. And like I said, they, they are native. They are native as well as the caterpillar um, or monarchs are, are native. And so this is the, my husband's dream garden um, where he's planting coleus and salvia. And so we've kind of had like not to appease our neighbors, but to appease my husband, we've kind of done this thing where we decided that our solution is the great divide. And this is the great divide. It's called a white picket fence. And so on the left side of the picket fence, you see my native garden that's only about a year and a half old. And on the right side is his. It's a little more colorful right now because it's fall. Um, but I think that you have to kind of just get over the idea of being one way or the other. You, you can kind of like Scott was saying, when you buy a plant and you want to buy a native plant and you plant it pull out something that's not native. I've got some non-native ground cover, so I'm just slowly but surely getting rid of this non-native ground cover um, and planting natives in, in place. So every little plant, that, the native plant that you put in, even if it's one or two, um, helps. It doesn't have to be your whole yard and you can still have your green lawn, but just maybe decrease the amount of lawn that you have. If you've ever are familiar with Doug Ptolemy, that's one of his 10 pointers is to just decrease the amount of green lawn that you, you put in. And this was one way of, that we did it is by, um, you know, taking out some of that green grass and putting in a native bed. De so, Debbie, um, yeah. Debbie, would you mind hitting the full screen button on that picture? It's just such a, a oh, great that, picture. Yeah. And I want to make sure everybody gets to see it. Oh yeah, I didn't know if it wouldn't make it big on, on your screen either. Okay, so can you see it better now? So yep. this side is my, this side is my natives, and this side is my husband's, and we we get along okay. We're still married, so <laughs> it can be done. So that's pretty, that's my two slides that I wanted to show you. Like right. tests are in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes you you got to get over that idea that it's got to all be the same you know, a, a, a formal garden would be. All right, thank you. I think um, in the short time we have left in this topic, uh, I think Crystal, has, she's got a lot of very diverse planting, so we're gonna let her uh, bring this one home for us. Crystal, I think you might be muted. Yes, I couldn't find the button. Goodness gracious. Uh, okay, so I think uh, to answer that question, there are so many beneficial insects that are predatory insects that will um, help with that problem if you plant uh, pollinator attractors that will uh, attract them personally. So there's many, there's pollinator charts, I'm sure that Grow Native has in terms of skippers, butterflies, bees, moths, uh, things of that nature. So the more diverse your plantings are, uh, the better it's going to be overall for the garden. So you're going to attract all these wonderful pollinators like bumblebees and honeybees and hummingbird moths and um, all kinds of things. And then these are the slides that I wanted to show earlier. I was finally able to uh, reach it. So. Uh, purple coneflower, all of these have supreme um, pollinator attractor benefits. They go to different taproot levels. So 
they're help replenishing the soil. Some of them are nitrogen fixers. Um, and a lot of them are medicinal. So um, they can be used for teas and tinctures and medicinal purposes. A lot of them are internal use and some are external only, but they have amazing medicinal properties. And I can share these with descriptions in the notes section, but these are all some of my favorite medicinals that are very uh, beneficial. And then this is the uh, slide I wanted to show you earlier that Hannah was describing. I was trying to um, give you a rundown of it. I think I'm blocking some of it with this. I'll go back to it. So this, you know, you can plant a miniature food forest in your front yard or backyard or side yard um, and start with a, a fruit tree. Typically a self-pollinating fruit tree is the best uh, because then you don't need pollination partners. So this here would be an Asian pear. Then we have nitrogen fixers such as Baptisia, blue false indigo, pumphrey, which is a dynamic accumulator. Um, you could integrate natives and non-natives, but uh, the fruit bearing natives as uh, Hannah was describing service berry and uh, Ronia berry are in this mix as well. So uh, that kind of describes that there's canopy layer, the understory layer, the vertical layer, um, the shrub layer, uh, the, the vegetation layer or the herb layer. And this is how it can be done in, in real life version. You could do a linear or in clusters like this is the pawpaws integrated with uh, perennial natives and fruit trees, uh, as well as herbs. So um, here's another guild that has many natives in it. And they all have this common purpose of attracting pollinators, providing food and habitat for wildlife. And then I just wanted to mention uh, one other thing uh, with replenishing soil and using the organic method. This is called hugo culture, and it's a method of digging a trench and then layering anything from your yard. So twigs, fallen branches, fallen leaves, pine needles, and putting it into a pile and letting it sit all fall. And then in the spring, ideally, it would be a ready to go garden bed that has weed suppression. You're building organic matter. You can look up hugo culture. You can get lost in a rabbit hole. And then just one more slide to share the beneficials and the, these from mainly for, um, the non-beneficial, the intruder insects are mainly attacking vegetable plants, but they also really do attack natives as well. So I can stop sharing. I apologize, I went over there. Uh, okay, so we have one more topic to cover. So in the topic of maintenance and um, probably in the world of native uh, use of native plants, this is the part where we really oftentimes are gonna diverge from uh, some of the things that we do. The idea of, of native plantings, at least in my mind, is to be more sustainable. And so, you know, very clearly one of the big goals that I have and most of my colleagues have is to eliminate the use of fuel and to eliminate the use of, of uh, fertilizers and pesticides. And, and so there is a, a significant difference, I think, on the maintenance side. So. Uh, and again, this can be a pretty long topic. We'll finish it up here, but um, maintenance really comes down to a question of maintaining the order. Um, you keep things in rows, you keep expect things to stay where they are, or you know, are you gonna allow it to self-organize? And certainly the question of mulching and surface coverings comes up, uh, pruning and training and plant maintenance. Again, I feel like that's something that's very common to any type of horticultural work. And then specifically what comes up a lot is fall preps. Um, and what we do in the spring as far as the differences with these native gardens. And so uh, again, on the maintenance uh, side of it, the kind of the sequence I put in the batting order was uh, Christine to lead us off and then we'll follow with Charlie. Great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen and I, I won't actually be going in that order. I think I'm really mostly just going to be diving into um, my last two slides here, which are about how our pollinators not only um, help and live in the garden in the spring and the summer and, and you know help with the fall, but they do overwinter. So a lot. This is just two examples um, on what happens with leaf litter and hollow plant stems. Um, and so, in in order to um, kind of help their overwintering, if you will, I put together this slide. Um, 
I'm currently in step one right now. Um, and I'm a little ridiculous about it. I actually lay my, when, once I cut everything down, I have some things that, you know, sun chokes, they're 12 feet right now. Those are all coming down and I just let them lay for about a week. And then I put them in my bins. I put them in my, I, I don't have compost in this neighborhood. I have way too much woody stuff to, to do that. Um, so I do have the, the leaf pickup, but I, I actually put them in open lidded bins with the big red X, which is available in at least Alton and I think the rest of Madison County. You can get the bags, the big paper bags, you know, and put your leaf and lawn litter in there, but I don't want to close them in. So it's kind of a little ridiculousness on my end, but um, that's my step one. And then the rest of it really kind of goes into the spring. So, um, you know, as, if you can keep your all your leaves, you know, on top of all your plants and your planted areas and your soon to be planted areas um, until at least 50 degrees for five days, that's when most of those insects are going to kind of become more alive and move out of their winter home. And so it's more safe to move that out and not not ruin, uh, you know, you want to keep them there. It's part of probably part of why you have those plants. Um, um, we had, I think he's mentioned, you know, do you mulch it and have it nice and neat or do you go let it have go into its own natural order? I go back and forth with that. And I think that we probably always will if we're living in a society that probably doesn't want a six foot prairie in every inch of my yard. Yep. Um, and then of course, as you're pruning, I guess step four really could actually go into the, um, into the fall is making sure you're not getting any of those uh, chrysalises or cocoons. I just found a gorgeous monarch. I don't know, maybe somebody here does if it's too late, if it's gonna do anything or because we've had too frost if, if it's a goner. But um, those are just a couple slides I wanted to talk about, just kind of really just be patient in the spring. And it's really exciting to wanna to get out and get started, but that's your planning time. So that's when you grab that paper and those magazines and start figuring out where you're getting your, your uh, plants from. Green, um, one of the things I think we can do also is like, if you need to cut down your tall goldenrod or the goldenrod especially, um, to leave about 18 inches of the stem on the plant over the winter so that those, how, those stems are available for the uh, solitary bees to lay in. And, you know, they'll grow up, be covered up next spring and you will never see. All right, Charlie, would you, you have anything to add? I know you've got a lot of experience maintaining these things for a long time. Hey, Charlie, are you on mute? Yeah, it helps if you remember to push the button. Um, <clears throat> I planted several spice bush because I like the uh, uh, spice bush uh, swallowtails. And I was uh, maybe making sure that they were uh, kept, fully, uh, you know, um, kept underneath it and kept the grass mowed and one thing or another. Well, guess what? Spice bush swallowtails, uh, when they lay eggs and then they uh, pupate and the, they drop down to the ground on the leaf litter. So if you, scrub up all the leaf litter from the spice bushes. You don't have any spice bush swallowtails the next year because you swept them all up with the leaves. So it's, it's that kind of uh, rigor that I really didn't understand. So for example, uh, leave the seed heads on all these uh, little short, or even the tall plants. Why? Well, birds are going to be eating the last of those seeds. And if you think that they're, all the seeds are gone, wait till you see it in the middle of December and they'll have a flock of birds out there on your seed heads. So the, the best kind of fall cleanup is one that doesn't happen. If you can avoid that for your neighbors, uh, like if you can take, take down the really tall plants that say nobody lives here, uh, at least that's what the neighbors interpret it as, uh, and do that and kind of leave them all out uh, long enough for the uh, little bugs that may be inside to, to go, you're going to have more birds next spring as well as more bu bugs. So 
lazy fall gardening is the best way to go. And then late spring gardening, as was mentioned earlier, is even better. Uh, wait until the weather's nice and warm and it's a good day to get out there and it's been 50 degrees or 60 degrees for a week or so. And then you can clean it up and your neighbors will be very happy and you say, oh my God, he's finally cleaning up his yard. And the birds and the bugs will love you the rest of the year. Excellent, excellent advice. Um, again, I, I personally, I leave, I've got several small prairie plantings in the yard and I leave one of them each year standing for the full year. So I try not to even remove uh, even the dead vegetation off of those just because it creates such great habitat uh, reservoirs for them. So um, again, a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about here. We're, we're already well over our sort of hour time limit. Um, and I know that we can kind of go on this for long periods of time. So um, again, if anybody has any final pieces to offer um, we did have a bunch of questions get asked in the Q&A and certainly we've tried to address those as best we could. Um, again, just kind of throw it to the panelists. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, any you know, final remarks or anything that you want to tie up, certainly we can share uh, information uh, out tomorrow when this gets done. And again, thank you to the sponsors again for, uh, for helping us put this thing together. So with that, we'll throw that back over to our uh, sponsors and let them kind of tie it up. Alicia, did you want to kind of see this thing off? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, we had some really great questions throughout the entire thing. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Scott, for moderating for us. Um, I will send a follow-up email tomorrow with a bunch of information, as much as I can fit in this email and everyone will get it. And we'll also have a recording of this um, panel webinar um, so that you can reference it later if you need to. Okay, so um, thanks a lot. Everybody have a good night. Good night, bye.